Hi everyone, welcome back to Survivor Sisters. Survivor Sisters is a podcast and organization that shares the stories of sexual assault survivors on college campuses to educate, empower, and inspire other survivors and their peers to take action against sexual assault. Today we're sitting down actually with Dr. Kathleen Taylor. She works at the American Institute for Cognitive Therapy in Midtown Manhattan and she's also a professor of psychology at Barnard College. She teaches a range of courses from intro psych to abnormal psychology and clinical psych laboratory. She's actually currently my professor for my psych senior seminar, which is all about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And I'm super excited to welcome Professor Taylor with us here today. I thought she was the perfect person to talk to all about trauma and the mental health effects that survivors experience as a result of their traumas because not only does she have a lot of experience treating trauma and mental illness in her patients but she also has a lot of experience educating others about trauma and mental illness through her classes so thank you so much professor taylor for being here thank you for having me the main topic of today's episode is obviously all about trauma and i think it's a really important topic to talk about because trauma obviously affects sexual assault survivors in profound ways specifically survivors are more susceptible for developing mental illness as a result of their trauma and it's really important to normalize the conversations around mental illness and to provide an understanding to survivors and to everyone in general about mental illness and how that manifests differently in different people and in order to process trauma I think it's important to actually have a good grasp of what it is and what is happening to you so you can in turn heal from that trauma and move forward. So I'm really excited to dive right in. I first just wanted to define what trauma is because I feel like, and this happens with a lot of mental illness terminology, that trauma and like, you know, OCD or PTSD, like it becomes misconstrued in our society and it's used in like our daily jargon every single day um, incorrectly. Like, you know, oh my God, I'm literally so OCD about that, or I have PTSD from that night, or, or whatever the case may be. And I feel like it just kind of creates this disconnect in our society. So I think it's important to just be clear on what trauma actually is. Sure, absolutely. So when we define trauma clinically, we're specifically saying that somebody has experienced something that is a physical assault or a sexual assault where they were um, in danger for their life or fearing that they were in some sort of really significant danger. So um, somebody who is beaten up, somebody who is in a life-threatening car accident, somebody who is violently attacked, somebody who is sexually assaulted. It can also be in first responders, people who witness the after effects, repeatedly witness the after effects of those kinds of traumatic experiences. We also can look at um, patterns of prolonged abuse, so somebody who maybe wasn't in fear of their lives but had some sort of sexual trauma that went on repeatedly can also be a traumatic experience. That doesn't mean to say that somebody who experiences something that doesn't clinically meet the criteria for something like a PTSD diagnosis. It doesn't intend to minimize what they experience. It's just that the way that we might go about treating it or the way that we kind of think about what that person is experiencing might be a little bit different depending on the severity and the nature of the traumatic experience. Yeah, it's really important to make that clear because trauma is something that happens to you and it's not necessarily like I don't want to say it's not necessarily an emotion but I think sometimes people feel like they can use it to describe like their emotions I don't know if that makes any sense it does make sense and I think sometimes people mistake significantly stressful events with traumatic events exactly so a student who says oh my gosh I was I worked so hard on this paper and I got to see I'm so traumatized I understand the emotion but the words we use to describe it maybe aren't quite accurate. So if you work really hard on something and you're really upset or really disappointed and you're experiencing a strong emotional response to that, of course you feel that and you feel it really, really deeply. And we don't think of that as a trauma. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It might be something you remember for a long time. So, for example, I still remember when a teacher wasn't available to answer a question for me on an exam, and I got it wrong. And as a result of that two points on that exam, I got a lower grade. So obviously I still remember this, but that wasn't a traumatic event. It was stressful, and it was frustrating, and it was annoying, and it was angering, but it wasn't a trauma. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to talk more about responses to trauma, specifically like when you are experiencing that traumatic event or feel like you're in danger. We've all heard of like the fight or flight response at some point in our lives. Can you talk a little bit more about that and any other kind of co- more common or standard responses to sure. trauma? Absolutely. So I think the first thing that's most important is that there is no standard response. Um, different people respond in different ways to trauma or to a potentially dangerous event. So the way that our brains and our bodies are designed in an incredibly fearful or um, uh, dangerous situation, our brains kind of go on to autopilot. And the entire, um, the entire focus is to just survive, to stay alive. So the body is just trying to stay alive. So that means you do get that fight or flight response, but that's not the only response that you get. So it's true that for some people in a dangerous response, you may try to fight it. You um, do what you need to do to, to destroy that thing that is trying to destroy you. Or you may try to run from it. So you may try to flee, run away, get away as fast as you can from it. But there's a third response that people don't always realize, and that's the freeze response. And that actually makes sense in a lot of situations. So if you don't know what's happening, or things are happening too fast for you to make sense of, you may not know if you should fight it or if you should run away from it. Maybe it's not safe to run away. Maybe it's even more dangerous where you run. So for many people, there's a freeze response. And that means just you're literally frozen. You don't know what to do. You can't think. You can't act. And you just, it's like your brain is waiting for more information. And that may be the best thing to do in some situations. So if you're on the edge of a cliff, running may throw you over the cliff. Or if there's an explosion, you may not know where to run in order to be safe. So sometimes people who have survived a sexual assault may think, why didn't I fight back? Or why didn't I run away from the situation? But your brain may be telling you that right in that moment, the best thing to do is to just stop and figure out what is the best way to survive the situation. And so it's always about survival. That's the most important thing. Yeah, exactly. And I'm glad that you touched upon this freeze response because actually a lot of survivors, they they do end up freezing up when we talked to Adriana and Summer in our previous episodes, they both talk about how they kind of froze up in the situation and they almost just succumbed to what was happening to them because they didn't know what to do and they gave up. They tried to fight. They tried to say no. But after a while, they ended up succumbing to what was happening to them and just being numb overall to the situation at hand. And I think there's like this misconception in our society that people... Like if you freeze up, that means that you're giving consent because you're not actively trying to fight someone off of you. You're not actively, you know, screaming at the top of your lungs or trying to get away. And it's important to recognize this because a lot of times that response is used against survivors to blame them for their assault um, when that's not the case at all. And in turn, like survivors can internalize that blame in themselves because they feel like, oh, well, I should have done more. I should have said no more. I should have tried to fight this person off more and it's all my fault and that's not the case at all. That's true and part of our understanding of that comes out of social psychology as well. So sometimes people operate under something called the just world hypothesis and this is the idea that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So it's really hard for us to accept sometimes that bad things can happen to good people. So we blame the victim, right? What's the difference between this person and me? So if this random thing could happen to this good person, then maybe this random thing could happen to me, and that's a really scary thought for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's also a really scary thought for somebody who has experienced this kind of a sexual assault or a trauma. Well. 
if I can figure out why this happened to me, maybe I can keep it from happening again. So, well, was it because I was dressed the wrong way, or I walked down the wrong street, or I said the wrong thing, or I didn't fight back hard enough? And none of those things matter. None of those things are true. Sexual assault is never about what the person did or didn't do. Sexual assault is about another person who is acting in a way that oftentimes has little or nothing to do with the person who is the victim of this crime. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that survivors almost feel helpless in that situation and they don't know exactly what to do. I'm not sure about the psychology behind that, but is is that something that relates to the way that they react in a situation of trauma? Of course, of course, because if the way that we understand the brain working, we have this kind of older, evolutionarily older part of the brain. Some people call it the lizard brain. And this is what's doing things like keeping us breathing, making sure digestion is working, but also responding to fear stimuli. Now, this isn't really the thinking part of the brain. The thinking part of the brain is the cortex. So that's kind of over the top of it. And while it's true that the thinking brain can kind of inhibit some of the things, can keep the lizard brain from acting out. So, you know, that's the thinking brain that keeps you from eating 27 cookies instead of just having one. But during times of extreme stress, it's like the thinking brain gets shut off and you're acting just from pure instinct. And pure instinct may not know what to do in a really frightening situation. Pure instinct is saying, do whatever you have to do to survive. So if somebody is saying, don't struggle or I'll kill you, your instinct brain is going, I better just survive this. And so anybody who has lived through a trauma has done exactly the right thing. They have survived. And the rest of it can come later. So shutting down, freezing, feeling like you are separate from your body, dissociating, all of those are survival strategies. And survival is the key that's what's most important. There is no one right way to respond. And I think things like movies and social media and so-called inspirational stories of somebody who fought back, all of those things may be true, but they're not true for most people. And I think that gives us a kind of a false idea of what we should do. We're not action heroes. We're not going to um, you know, take a pencil and a stapler and a cell phone and be able to make some sort of a device that will blow something up. None of us can do that. That's not real. That's Hollywood. And it's true that some people fight and are able to fight back, and great, that's worked for them, and that's terrific. That's how they survived. Other people survive by distancing themselves from the event while it's happening, or just saying, well, I'll just get through this, or backing away mentally from it. It's all about your body, your brain is trying to make sure you live through this experience. Because if you're alive, you can recover. And I love that you said that everyone who experiences trauma does exactly the right thing in, the, in that situation. Because, again, like it's so important to show that every response to trauma is a normal response to trauma. And you can't use that response to blame the survivor of the trauma or for them to blame themselves for the way that they responded. Exactly. And while I absolutely, sincerely, and fervently hope that not everybody has to learn what their response would be to a trauma, in reality, nobody knows what their response would be until they experience it. So somebody might say, well, I would fight back, or I would do this, or I would do that. And maybe that's true. Maybe, maybe you would do that. But until you've experienced this, you don't know what your response will be. And that's okay, right? Nobody knows, and I hope for many of your listeners, they never have to learn this. But do know that if you are in that situation, survival is what you do. I think it's also important for people who experience trauma to understand and for other people to understand that a lot of times people who experience a trauma may lose their memory for some parts of the trauma or only remember specific really salient parts of it. Mm -hmm. So somebody might not be able to remember what 
their assailant was wearing, but they can remember the smell of the individual person. Or they might not remember what hair color they had, but they can remember a mole that they saw on the person's face. Mm -hmm. um, another person might think that they didn't fight back, but there's evidence of bruising on their arms to show that they were pinned down and held, which suggests that they really did fight back. Because of this survival mechanism, we're not looking at the whole picture if you're experiencing a trauma. You're just paying attention to what you need to do to survive. Little pieces may be recalled, but you may not recall the whole picture. You may even lose a lot of memory for the traumatic event itself. You may remember leading up to it and afterwards. That's really a typical response or something we often see. It's also not unusual for people who experience a trauma to have physiological responses that they didn't expect. So maybe their body was responding in a se to a sexual assault in a way that was very unpredictable, but it's also very normal. So. There is no one normal way to respond. Some people remember every detail, some people remember very little. Some people feel like they couldn't feel anything in their body. Some people may have a lot of feelings in their body while they're experiencing a trauma. And I think it's important to remember that no one response is typical. Everything is typical. Yeah, and I think that what you're saying about the physiological response, especially, is important for male survivors, a lot of times people will, they don't understand how a man could be raped or sexually assaulted because how do you, you know, get an erection if you're not turned on or if you don't want to have sex or engage in some sort of sexual act. And so it's really important to separate the physiological response of your body from the actual cognitive thoughts and feelings that you're having in regards to the assault. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the source of a lot of guilt and shame for some survivors. How could my body have responded this way if I didn't want it? Well, your body responds in that way because that's the way the nerves and the blood vessels are configured. And it's a natural response and it's an instinctive response. But that doesn't mean that you made the choice and that you wanted this to happen. Yeah, exactly. So it's really important for survivors to remember that the way that your body responds has nothing to do with the consent that you did give or did not give. Um, and it shouldn't be used as a way to blame survivors or to blame yourself for something that happened to you that you did not consent for. So I just want to move on to the effects that trauma has like in its aftermath i guess how does for example trauma affect your brain okay so in the immediate aftermath some people may feel an incredible amount of relief some people may even feel giddy or almost like happy immediately afterwards like oh my gosh i survived this thing some people may feel completely separated from themselves um, some people may feel, I mean, you, you name it, the range of emotions is all there. There is no one right or one typical way to feel after an experience like this. Some people may completely shut down. So a response to a dangerous situation may be, okay, I've survived this and now I'm just going to go on about my, my day uh, because that's the only way that you can deal with something that big is to just distance yourself from it for a little while. There's nothing wrong about any one kind of response. It's just, again, people assume, well, if something horribly traumatic like that happened to me, I would cry or I would be upset or I would go and seek help. And maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Um, maybe for some people you need to just say uh, or distance yourself from it in a way that says, I'm, it's too big for me to think about right now, so I'm not going to think about it. In terms of what kinds of changes are going on in the brain, we really don't know. And part of the reason we don't know is because we don't have a way to measure it, right? Mm -hmm. We can't ask a brain what's going on. We, we can look at what kinds of things are active in brains during fearful situations and things like that. But there's no one right response and no one right way to deal with trauma. 
some people may have a response that comes or fear that comes up an hour later or two hours later or ten hours later or a day later or two days later and somebody might say oh I'm fine that didn't that's okay I can live through this and then a week later they're they're experiencing something most people who experience a trauma will have some sort of aftermath from that um, and it's that's absolutely normal it may be fear responses it may be difficulty sleeping it may be difficulty eating it may be eating too much it may be using substances to try to avoid the big emotions that are associated with it all of that is normal trying to escape these big huge emotions absolutely normal and anything that is a reminder of that event may bring up big emotions like those kinds of fear emotions as well so I think an important thing too to mention is that anybody who experiences a trauma will have some effect of that but not everybody who experiences a trauma will experience PTSD so PTSD is a very specific post-traumatic stress disorder is a very specific clinical diagnosis that has some very specific behaviors associated with it but not all p trauma survivors will experience PTSD now that doesn't mean that the trauma isn't impactful that it isn't um, difficult for somebody to deal with but most people who experience a trauma will have big emotions that will subside in time on their own, but not everybody. And a lot of people need some help to work through those emotions. Can you talk a little bit more about what PTSD is and what it looks like? Sure. So PTSD is a number of different symptoms that come up after somebody has experienced a trauma. And to be diagnosed with PTSD, you have to be at least 30 days after the trauma has occurred. But the pattern of responses are things like um, intrusive symptoms, so having lots of nightmares about the event, or having recurrent intrusive memories. So for example, you might be sitting at your kitchen table having a cup of coffee, and all of a sudden you're thinking about this event that happened, the sexual trauma. It's not the same thing as a flashback. A flashback occurs when you believe you're actually in that situation again and you can't distinguish that memory of the event from reality. But intrusive memories can occur um, anytime, anywhere, and they're uncontrollable. People also experience changes in the way they view the world and the way they think about things. So for example, somebody may feel like their, the world is an unsafe place and they're not safe anywhere. Or they may now believe that there are no good people in the world or that everybody is dangerous. So significant changes in, in their mood and in the way that they think about things. People may f experience arousal symptoms, so things like being hypervigilant. So someone who maybe didn't have any problem with somebody coming up and touching them on the shoulder or arm may now feel like they don't want to be touched or if they hear a noise they jump or before they go to bed at night they have to make sure that every window and every door is locked and they're checking they have to open the doors and check in their closets to make sure that everything is safe um, they may avoid crowds or may not be feeling comfortable if they're in a crowded restaurant or on a subway car where there's lots of people. They may also avoid a lot of things. Avoid things that would remind them of that experience or avoid things that may uh, remind them of their attacker. All of those are symptoms of PTSD. Yeah, I'm actually just thinking about in our last episode we interviewed Summer. She talked a lot about how at night she couldn't sleep in her dorm room and so she would just wander around campus or waste time in the library because she couldn't go back to that place during the time that she was raped and so what you're saying just made me think about how PTSD can manifest in survivors and it really can cause a lot of diminished functioning I mean if you can't sleep like she would she would walk around until like 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning and then she would go to sleep but she still was a student, she still had classes, she still had work, but yet she couldn't function properly because 
she couldn't handle being in that in that space because absolutely. it was so triggering for her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything that's a reminder is going to bring up those big emotions. And one of the theories of PTSD and what's happening in PTSD is that people aren't able to kind of disconnect those really strong emotions from the memory of an event. So it's absolutely normal when you experience a trauma to look around and what are all of these things that are associated with this traumatic event. And it might be sights, it might be sounds, it might be odors. Um, and so if you see that thing again, you remember that event. If you smell something from it that was associated with that, you might remember that event. But people who aren't experiencing PTSD, when they see those reminders, they might have a strong emotional response the first time, and then the second time it's just a tiny bit less, and the third time a tiny bit less, so that over time, as they experience these reminders, the emotional impact becomes less and less and less. So it's not that you forget about the event, it's that reminders of the event don't bring up those tremendously strong, painful emotions. But with PTSD, we feel like people get stuck. And they don't have that extinction response where the memories no longer evoke those really, really strong responses. But instead, every time there's a reminder, those emotions stay at a really, really high level. So somebody who goes back to their dorm room, that bed is such a strong reminder and the emotions are so big that the person leaves that situation. Absolutely normal. Another thing that can occur when somebody has experienced trauma is that they'll use substances, they might use substances in order to avoid the emotions that are associated with those reminders. So it's not unusual to see comorbid substance use disorders in people with PTSD, using alcohol, using weed, um, using opiates, anything that would dull that emotional response to those memories of that event. And how do you go about treating PTSD or treating substance use disorder? It really depends on what's going on with the individual. So um, for some people, if the substance use disorder is such that they're using every single day, um, you kind of have to get people to stop using substances so you can go after the trauma itself. Mm -hmm. Trauma therapies, the, the, the evidence-based trauma therapies that people use are really about helping people learn to separate the emotional experience from the memory. So it's not trying to say, oh, well, this is an okay thing that happened to you because on no level will that ever be okay. But it is saying this happened and we can help you decrease your emotional response to that memory. And the way that we do this is through some version of exposure therapy, where the person in a safe way will describe the, their experience and go through a narrative about that and let themselves feel these emotions but in a safe space so that they are not in danger and to do this over and over and over and over again until the emotions that they feel in describing this decrease. It's a really difficult therapy and people who undergo this are, I think, just so incredibly brave because it is asking them to re-experience to a certain extent these things. Now, depending on the treatment and depending on the, the, the treatment protocol you use, we also incorporate things like learning how to tolerate distressing emotions and learning some skills so that those emotions don't get so overwhelming that they feel unmanageable. Learning how to regulate emotions a little bit. Some of the therapies, for example, cognitive processing therapy, looks at what kinds of changes in thinking patterns do people experience. So looking for how their thinking has changed around things like safety, trust, power and control, and self-esteem, and really challenging some of these thoughts. So somebody who says, well, this was all my fault, we would challenge that kind of a belief and say, well, let's look at the facts of this situation. 
did you do anything to actually cause this? And when you look at this, we help people understand that, in fact, they did not typically do anything to cause this kind of an attack. Nobody has ever done anything to cause themselves to be raped. Yeah, I think that's really important to reiterate that because survivors have a tendency to blame themselves and I think that's partially because a lot of society ends up blaming them or turning it around on them and and victim blaming them and that manifests internally within their own emotions and they feel like they caused this in some way or they did something to put themselves in this situation and the fact of the matter is like that's not the case at all that's true and it's it's a normal human response when something happens that you wish had not happened to think back and say well what if I had done this or if this had been different this thing wouldn't have happened and all of that may be true right um, somebody who has survived a sexual assault may think well if I hadn't been in this place I wouldn't have been assaulted okay sure if you hadn't been there and that person hadn't been there then that event would not have happened in that time and that place that may be a true thing but there's also a thing called hindsight bias. And hindsight bias occurs when you look back and you think, well, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. Sure, right? We all do yeah, that. Right? It's really easy to do. But what was the information you had at the time? Did you have any reason to think, well, if I go and do this thing, I'm going to be raped? Of course not, because if you knew that, you wouldn't have gone and done that thing. So. It's not really treating yourself fairly to say, well, I'm going to look back on this and say, well, I should have known. No, you shouldn't, not necessarily. And even if you had, that's not permission for anybody to assault you. Yeah, especially because I think it's some ridiculous number, like nine out of ten times the survivor knows their assailant and they, they trust their assailant. It's someone that they... Uh, personally have a personal relationship with and so of course like how are you supposed to know that you know this person who you trust and you had a positive relationship with would ever do something to harm you in this way exactly exactly and it's unfortunate that we can't always know how trustworthy a person is until they have violated that trust but that's one of the things that we really focus on in therapy because a lot of times people say, well, I'll never trust men again, or I'll never trust this category of person again, whoever's assaulted them. But that can be a really lonely way to live. So instead we talk about things like, well, who can you trust? Would you trust somebody to pay you back if you loan them $10? Or would you trust that this person is safe to be around in a coffee shop? or is this person safe to be around if two other people are there, right? So while you may be hesitant to trust being alone and secluded with somebody that you don't know well, understandable, there are ways that you can start rebuilding trust in people in a safe way. Yes, for sure. Another mental illness that survivors are more susceptible of developing as a result of trauma is depression. Can you talk a little bit more about what depression is and how, I know that everyone is different and experiences depression differently, but how it can manifest in different people. I feel like depression is another one of those things where people constantly misuse the word and they'll say, oh my God, I'm so depressed, when in actuality they're not. So I think it's important to like make a clear distinction as well. Sure, absolutely. So again, it's another clinical term and we use specific criteria so that uh, if I say, well, I'm working with somebody who is depressed, another clinical psychologist would understand what kinds of symptoms that person is probably expressing. And depression is characterized by either sad mood or a loss of interest in things that were normally pre or previously pleasurable. So somebody might experience a lot of sadness or somebody may just lose interest in things that they used to like doing. Um, and that goes on for a minimum of two weeks. And then other kinds of symptoms like changes in sleep, either sleeping more or sleeping less, changes in appetite, eating more or eating less, um, possibly a change in, in body weight, uh, maybe feeling very agitated or very slowed down. All of these are symptoms of depression. 
there are a lot of different kinds of things that can trigger a depression. We don't really know all of the causes, but definitely the experience of trauma can be a trigger event for a depressive episode. And again, clinically what you focus on when you're treating somebody really depends on what the person is experiencing. And like we were talking about before, that there is no one response to a traumatic event, there's also not one typical response um, after a traumatic event. Some people may feel depressed. Some people may want to isolate themselves and not interact with the world. Some people may turn it into activism and go out and talk to other people and find that is the way that they can make sense of what they experienced. Yeah, and actually a lot of survivors do turn to activism and advocacy for other survivors because this is something that once they have started to heal uh, and move forward, it's something that they feel strongly about um, and want to help other people and show them that they're not alone and that they can get through this. And that's, I think it's really admirable because sometimes doing that work can be triggering because you have to continually re-experience your trauma when you're sharing your story or listening to someone else's. Absolutely. But again, from a therapeutic standpoint, the more somebody is able to discuss this and you know, feel those feelings again in a way that's safe, that's going to actually help. And it's going to help decrease those huge emotions that come from the memories associated with the trauma. Sometimes people talk about being triggered or re-traumatizing, like somehow they should not think about or talk about what they've experienced, but that avoidance is actually more harmful than helpful. And so while it's true you might want to start by thinking about these things in a safe place where you can experience these emotions and if that means you need to cry, then you cry. But saying, I'm just never going to think about this again. Emotions have a way of sneaking up on you. And if you're not going to listen to them, they will find a way to be heard. And so saying, I'm not going to think about it, I'm just going to shut it down, I just won't think about it and I'll be okay, that usually isn't helpful and it's often not a very healthy way of dealing with it. So thinking about it, talking about it, working through it with a therapist, talking about it with close friends, that can all be very helpful. Yeah, and that's exactly why I wanted to talk with you today because I feel like survivors also just have a tendency to bury everything and avoid dealing with what happened to them and in turn like avoid the mental health effects that the trauma has on them and you know mental illness is something that needs to be taken more seriously because you know, mental illness can take lives and I feel like in our society today it's just we don't prioritize taking care of your mental health as much as we may for our physical health and so it's really important for survivors to develop a better understanding of what's happening to them and to show them that this is something that they need to take seriously and do something about because otherwise it will catch up to them like you said yeah. absolutely and again you know I, I do want to emphasize too that while we do talk about PTSD and depression and substance use disorders and all of these things do happen and can be an after effect of a sexual trauma, they don't have to be. And it's not the, that you have to wait a month before you go and get help. If you've experienced a trauma, you can seek help immediately. And it's true, you will go through some things. It's not that you can go and talk to somebody one time and poof, everything will be better. You've experienced something really huge and that's going to take some time. It's going to say take effort, it's going to take a lot of compassion and understanding. Compassion for yourself, compassion from other people, and help and support. And it's okay to ask for that help. It's absolutely okay to ask for help from your college mental health counseling center, to ask for help from family members, 
to find a qualified professional you can talk to. Um, and all of those things will help. Trauma therapy and working through and processing trauma is not about getting rid of a memory. This is an event that's happened and we are all a product of our experiences. So it's something that has happened and it does change you in some ways. But with help and with support, you can make some choices about how that change occurs and what that change is going to look like in the long run. Yeah, I agree. And I also just think like in terms of mental health effects, like I guess the hallmark is diminished functioning in your daily lives. And I feel like a lot of times people don't necessarily understand how that is possible, especially if you've never experienced mental illness before. Like if you're depressed and you can't get out of bed or you can't take a shower, even though it's been a week since the last time you did one, like it's easy for someone to say, oh, just like take a shower, get out of bed, you can do it. And in reality, you can't because it's just so taxing and it's hard to just even do daily things. Absolutely. And you know, the same way that if you saw somebody on crutches with a broken leg and a cast on their leg and they said, I haven't been able to take a shower for a week, you wouldn't say, well, why don't you just go take a shower? But exactly. mental illness, you're not walking around with a cast on your leg. And so people often don't see an injury, so they think that you must not be injured. And about the worst thing you can do for somebody who's experiencing a mental health problem is to say, well, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, or why don't you just go do this thing? Because it's kind of like saying to somebody else, well, why don't you just jump off of this five-story building and flap your arms, because you'll fly. It's just fine. Yeah. And somebody who is experiencing a mental health crisis can no more pull themselves up by the bootstraps than you can fly from the top of a five-story building safely. Yeah. I think people just don't understand that mental illness affects all aspects of your life. It affects your daily functioning, it affects your social relationships, it affects your academic performance or your work performance, and it's not just something that you can turn off and on. It's something that you're always dealing with and always trying to process and understand. And, and if you don't seek out help, it's, it's even more difficult to overcome. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we still have this stigma in our culture that mental illness is something that should be secret or should somehow be shameful. And so people are less likely to ask for help. But the same way that you would ask for help if you had a sprained wrist and you couldn't write notes and you would ask somebody for help taking notes, it would be a lot more effective for you if you were willing to go to your professors and say, I'm really depressed right now things are just happening a lot more slowly for me, can you help me? Right? Or if you can say to your friends, I'm really having a bad day, can you just sit with me and we can watch an hour of TV together? Now that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can do for yourself, because there are, but compassion for yourself and for people you see who are struggling is a really essential part of mental wellness. Yeah, I feel like as a society today, we have a huge compassion and empathy problem where we are very quick to judge others and not treat people with, with compassion and empathize with what they're going through. As a result, it creates this stigma. And that's why I felt like this was such an important topic to talk about with you today because we need to normalize having these conversations and we need to normalize and destigmatize mental illness in general and also create a better understanding for survivors about what they're going through and hopefully in turn this will help them better process their trauma and the aftermath of that trauma and heal from from that as well. But I think a lot of times that judgment comes from fear and people are frightened because the media portrayals often of mental illness are the crazy person who's committing violent crimes or the person who commits suicide. And those are very, very frightening things to people. So mental illness becomes stigmatized. But I, I think it's a pretty rare family who has no history of mental illness. 
I can't think of any families that I know, both from obviously professionally because that's my what I'm working mm-hmm. in, but also friends, extended family, things like that. Mental illness, I think, touches everybody's lives in some way or another. And so having compassion, um, letting go of those kinds of judgments, but also letting go of fear. And I think podcasts like what you're working on here in these kinds of conversations are a really great way to start saying, like, look, this is something that touches everybody. Um, And you might be the mentally healthiest person walking down the street, but things can happen to you that can result in difficulties and problems and there's help for that and there's compassion for that and being afraid to ask for that just makes things worse instead of better yeah i agree and i just wanted to thank you again for sitting down with me today i really appreciate it and i hope that everyone listening has been able to leave with a better understanding of trauma and how trauma affects survivors and affects our mental health in general. I think it's a really important topic to discuss and thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for having me. If you want to learn more about Professor Taylor, I'm going to be linking the social media for her practice, American Institute for Cognitive Therapy in Midtown Manhattan, and if you want to hear more stories about survivors or more interviews with professionals who can help survivors and arm them with resources necessary for their healing journeys, please subscribe and leave a five-star review if you enjoyed listening today. I know I learned so much, even though, you know, psych is my major, I still learned a lot, and I hope that everyone listening is leaving with some better understanding of trauma and how it affects survivors and specifically I hope that the survivors who are listening leave with a better understanding about what they're going through and hopefully we'll use that to make positive changes. Survivor Sisters is here for everyone if you want to reach out and share your story with us or if you need any type of support we're here to help you and support you in any way that we can. Follow us on Instagram at Survivor Sisters. Thank you so much again for being here and with that This concludes our third episode.